Well, welcome to part three of selecting seed for alfalfa in 2020. That's our main topic for the day. And we're going to look at it in three parts, and that's going to be around end use, crop management technology needs, and seed coating. So when we think about end use, what are we talking about? Well, mostly in the upper Midwest, what we're talking about is a very high digestibility, high protein, high tonnage product for dairy cattle. But we could also be looking at an end use that involves beef cattle where we still want high tonnage, high standability because we may have a wider cutting window, and we also don't have to have that high relative feed quality, so moderate digestibility in most cases. The other end use could be some kind of a specialty animal or perhaps horses, where you've got to make sure you get a very pure stand so we don't have any digestive upsets, high digestibility, and again, you still want that tonnage to make it pay. So when we think about crop management technology needs, we're talking about what do we have to think of in regards to stand establishment? Are we going to be using a nurse crop that we want to harvest and so we don't have to worry about maybe spraying it off to kill it so that we can let the alfalfa come through? Or are we talking about something where we're just going to spray it off and we need some kind of a Roundup Ready event in that alfalfa? What about number of cuttings? Are we going to be very intensively managed? Are we going to go for three cuttings, four cuttings, maybe even five? to where there's going to be a lot of additional wheel traffic. So again, we've got to have a variety that can stand up to that, and that's really important when we're making our selections. And then the last one, disease resistance. We'll look at that pretty closely, but most of the disease resistance that we're going to talk about, we have to have because most of those diseases are very inherent to our trade area. So we score our alfalfa on a lot of different things. We look at what herbicide resistance, if any, does it have. We score them on yields, nine being our highest, one being our lowest. We look at fall dormancy ratings. Is it a four that's earlier or a five that's later as far as when it actually goes dormant in the fall? Winter hardiness. How well does it survive winter? In other words, is it going to come through the winter well? Stand persistence. That goes back more to that, are we going to be on that three cut, four cut, maybe even five cut system? Standability. If we let that stand go out to 35, 40 days, is it going to stand up still to where we can have a harvestable crop? Quality is all about relative feed quality. Are we going to get the relative feed quality that we want for what our needs are? And then milk yield per acre is simply yield times that RFQ to where if we've got a 9 in that milk yield per acre, we've got more than likely either an 8 or 9 on relative feed quality or, and an 8 or 9 on yield. Disease resistance we're going to touch on quite a bit, and then pest resistance in some areas is important. The disease resistance piece scores seven different traits, and again, most of these that I have blocked out here are very relevant for our trade area. So it's important that we look at all of them. If it's a highly resistant variety in one of those diseases, it gets a score of five. So a product that has a 35 means that it has a highly resistant strain in that actual variety that can resist that disease. So again, you look at here, 55 BRO10, very highly resistant for the most part, except for Fusarium, one score below. 55 BRO8, across the board, highly resistant to all of those diseases. The HR under bacterial wilt is just simply that that's an upgraded score through further observations. So when you look at disease resistance, one that gets a lot of press is a phantomyces. And to date, there's only two that have actually been identified that we actually have tests for, race one and race two. What I've highlighted on this slide are the varieties that we have that are highly resistant for both race one and race two. So those particular products, VR10, VRO8, VQ52, V50, and 55H96, are all highly resistant for Aphanomyces race one, race two. Why do I bring that up? Because there's some marketing and a little bit of talk out there about a race three. Well, there is no actual test for a race three. There's probably 20 plus additional races of Aphanomyces out there, but only two that we can actually test for and identify. But when we breed to get high resistance for one and two, we're actually selecting against a lot of those 20 plus other races. So the best terminology out there to use is multi-race and Pioneer does a great job of selecting against multi-race aphanomyces. So don't get taken by the marketing. There's only one and two. A lot of other ones get selected against, but to date we don't have a test for anything more than aphanomyces race one or two. 
So here's a chart that you might see out there with some of your sales agencies that basically shows relative feed quality on the vertical axis and relative yield or tons on the horizontal axis. So anything way out to the right, that's your best yielding product. The further you up you go, that's going to be your highest quality. So 54Q14 would be the highest quality product we have of a non-harv extra. 54VR10 would be our highest yielding alfalfa. So anytime you need to know what you're looking at, look for those key letters. If there's a Q in the name, that means it's a high quality variety. If it's a V, it's a muscle variety. R means it contains the Roundup. H means it's a leaf hopper resistant variety. This is what happens when we put our Harv Extra varieties into this chart. Because they are such high quality, it shoves everything else down the chart, doesn't lose the yield portion of the adjustment on each of those products, but the quality gets pushed down to where Q14 is still the highest of the non Harv Extra. But on same day cutting, your Harv Extras are going to be 116, 117% of the average, whereas Q14 will be 106, so roughly 10% better than our best non harb extra quality variety. So let's talk about seed coating. Pioneer absolutely believes in seed coating. We're going to go through that. We need a rhizobium inoculant on there to make sure that that seedling gets off to a good start, has what it needs to really get up and go. The fungicide to protect it from all those diseases that we've selected against but we still are going to try to give it a little extra help. And then we do have a polymer on ours that helps with flowability and a protective coating as we're putting on those right zobium and fungicide treatments. But we do not have a limestone carrier and no limestone carrier is needed. Here's the simple math on it. What you want to buy when you buy alfalfa is what? You want to buy viable seed. So make sure that you look at that tag closely. Raw alfalfa, as we go through the math here real quick, is 227,000 seeds per pound. So let's take off the coatings. 9% for ours, 34% for others in the marketplace. You see what's left over. Then look at 90% germ of that seed that you have left over. You end up with 185,000 per pound within the Pioneer, 134,800 within the 34% coated. So if you want to get 70 plants per square foot, which is between the 60 to 80 that's typically recommended. You do the math. With ours, you've got to put on about 16.4 pounds out of a 50-pound bag of ours to get that 70 plants per square foot. But if you look at the other side where it's 34%, you've got to put on 22.6 pounds of their seed or it only covers about 2.21 acres. So again, you've got to use quote-unquote 38% more pounds of seed to establish the same stand with the high coating material. And don't forget, technology fees, the Roundup Ready and the Harv Extra fees are on a per bag basis. So that bag of seed that's got the 34% seed coating is even more expensive. And do you need that limestone coating? No, absolutely not. Haps, helps nothing with seed establishment or stand establishment. And so you look at a simple trial that we did down in Southeast Minnesota in 2017, whether it was put on at 10 pounds or 18 pounds, the heavy seed coat was way behind on actual plants per square foot once we got it established. So again, there is absolutely no benefit to the limestone carrier in regards to getting a good stand established. So to sum up, make sure as you're selecting your seed for 2020 that you know what the end use is gonna be. Is it dairy, is it beef, or is it a specialty animal? What kind of crop management technology needs do you have? Is it going to be where you're trying to spray off that nurse crop or are you actually going to harvest it? Do you just want a pure stand that you are going to come in and spray anyway to get rid of the weeds at a certain point? So again, do you need the Roundup Ready? Or do you want the Harv Extra where you're going to go with a reduced number of cuttings or you're going to go for the real rocket fuel by doing the same number of cuttings you usually do and getting the higher relative feed quality? And then last but by far not least on the value of what you're getting on your seed, look at that seed coating, make sure you do the math to understand what you're actually buying in the amount of viable seed. So that's it for part three. We have stressed early on the importance of the right pH, proper sampling, planning ahead, selecting the right lime source, and now selecting the right seed. 
Come spring, we'll talk about part four, about getting that ground ready to get a good seed bed established and so that we get a great stand in the spring. Thanks. We'll see you next time. That concludes this Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.